Saints are heading into the second international break without a win. It's four points from seven games and a captain with a suspension to serve. So is it time to panic yet? Hello and welcome to the latest episode of the Total Saints podcast. My name is Martin Stark and each week I'm joined by our highly esteemed panel to reflect on all things Southampton Football Club. Coming up this week on the pod, reaction to the Chelsea game and we look ahead to an important run of fixtures that starts with Leeds at St Mary's. Plus, Eliza Dunn, the Senior Fundraising Officer for the Saints Foundation, joins us to talk about a charity walk through Southampton to celebrate their 20th anniversary season. As always, a big welcome to our regular residence, owner of Saints Web, Steve Grant. How's your week been, Steve? A uh, busy one, actually. Yeah, plenty, plenty going on and uh, yeah, topped off topped off with a very, very wet Saturday, um, which was uh, not ideal, but uh, but decent decent weekend, all told. Good. Any live football this week for you? Yeah, I was at Northampton um, for Sutton's Sutton's game up there. I've done I've done Stamford Bridge more times than I care to remember, <laughs> so I'd uh, I'd kind of already already sort of written that one off as one I was not too bothered about uh, about making. And how does uh, Northampton compare to Stamford Bridge? Um, well, I mean, it's it's kind of half finished. It's weird. So I don't don't know if, don't know if you know the story, but basically they they tried to expand one of the stands um, about six or seven years ago. They Got a twelve million pound loan from the from the local council, and the they basically started the building work, put all the steel work up for the um, sort of expansion of the stands to sort of make an upper tier with corporate boxes and all that sort of nonsense. Nice. And the money vanished into into uh, companies owned by the then club owner. Ah, <laughs> um, so that went well, right? Okay. Um, so there's, I mean, there's still an ongoing criminal investigation into that, and it will it will not end well for anybody. Um, I mean, the council, I think, declared bankruptcy about eight months ago. So it's, yeah, it's just, it's an absolute mess. You're right. I wasn't expecting that answer no. so early in the morning, <laughs> but good to know. Uh, also with us is writer of the blog League One Minus 10. That is Glenn Delacour. How's your week been, Glenn? It's been an interesting week because I actually, I actually went in and saw my workmates for the first time in, uh, in 18 months so uh, it was uh, yeah someone was retiring so I didn't actually go to work I just went to the pub so it was uh, yeah it was, it was all right I, I think that's enough for a, another 18 months I don't want to see him again uh, <laughs> it's been quite nice no one noticed that I've lost two stone and then I realized why it's because I put on two stone initially <laughs> so as far as they're concerned I look exactly the same which was uh, which was something I couldn't quite get my head around I thought I was thinking everyone's going to think I look great but no no, no none, just of, none of that at all so uh, <laughs> so yeah that was kind of the highlight of the week good uh, also with us is the athletics dedicated Saints reporter that's Dan Sheldon how was uh, Stamford Bridge for you Dan yeah it was um, a good day a friend of mine lives up up close to not too far from the stadium so I met them for breakfast in the morning and took in the game and yeah it was a uh, I enjoyed the game. I thought it was um, fairly entertaining and then got home sort of late last night and it was all good. Yeah, Plenty to talk about, that's for sure. Uh, of course, the biggest hello and thank you is always reserved to our patrons wherever you might be listening this week, wherever around the world. It's very much appreciated. Welcome to episode 170 of the Total Saints podcast. This is the Total Saints podcast with Martin Stark, Steve Grant, Glenn Delacour and the Athletics' Dan Sheldon. A red card for Saints captain James Ward-Prowse tipped the game in favour of the European champions, but it felt like another performance to be proud of. What did you make of the game, Steve? Yeah, I mean, it was it was frustrating in, in many ways in that we'd kind of got ourselves a bit of a foothold in the game uh, midway through that second half. And you kind of thought, well, it's the game's in the balance. We're we're looking all right here, and then the red card happens, and and you kind of felt that at that point it was a case of when rather than if Chelsea Chelsea got the got themselves back in front because at the end of the day they they still created chances throughout the game had a couple of goals disallowed in the first half. I mean, one was for offside uh, from the Kaku, which was which was absolutely spot on. The one for the foul on Walker Peters was a little bit iffy, I, I must say, but it was. I mean, we we defended okay, but McCarthy was our was our man the match. So that that kind of says that that we weren't quite as um, as solid structurally as as we were against Man City a couple of weeks ago. Um, but I think we I think we kind of expected that because Chelsea offer a, a much more varied attack than than City do. City, you kind of know know how to defend against it if you're good enough to do it. Chelsea have got Chelsea can hurt you in in so many different ways, and and eventually it 
that that pressure kind of kind of told late in the game. I think with with tiring legs, unfortunately. Yeah, falling behind to a fairly decent goal, but a spirited comeback for the equaliser, Glenn. Yeah, I found the I found the first half very frustrating because we didn't we did very very little going forward, and we seemed to be happy just to contain and uh, try and get in at half time, sort of one nil down. There was very very little connection with the um, you know between the midfield and the attack, and I found that frustrating. But the the second half, Ralph was proactive at half time, which is um, one thing he should be praised for by um, changing the formation and and. For the first 15 minutes of the second half, you know, we looked at least their equal, which is, you know, which is which is fairly good going, bearing in mind the players that they've got. Um, and the penalty was, um, you know, was reward for that. We, you know, we suddenly started putting a bit of pressure on them further up the pitch and, uh, yeah, got the penalty, scored that. And I was, I was quite confident we were going to hang on for a point. You know, I, I didn't, uh, Chelsea seemed to be getting very frustrated um, you could see Mr. Tuchel on the sideline going absolutely mental mm. at various times. Yeah, he wasn't wasn't a happy boy. But once once the red card happened, I agree with Steve. It was it was kind of inevitable. But I, I have to say, the second goal they scored is a brilliant goal. Wh- yeah. Whatever way you look at it, it's a it's a brilliant ball, great first time cross, and the German Shane Long does what he does <laughs> against us. Um, <laughs> I was, I was looking it up. He's got seven, he's now got seven goals in forty one games, and three are against us. <laughs> he's got just as many that have been ruled out by VAR, hasn't he? It's, yeah, he's well, he's a, yeah, he's always offside. <laughs> he's always offside, isn't he? But yeah, I mean, the the, the second goal, the pass from Barkley came mm. came from exactly the area of the pitch where War Prowse would have been. I think our organisation post red card, I don't think was brilliant. We didn't seem to have the right players in the right positions, sort mm. of thing. So I, I do take a bit of an issue with that. But uh, but no, get, getting back into the game, uh, you know, I thought we uh, I thought we looked good. It's just a, sh- a shame the red card happened. We'll get on to Martin Atkinson and VAR and Mike Dean in just a minute. But Dan, it felt for a vast majority of the game that the game plan worked, which was to press and unsettle Chelsea. I know you weren't particularly impressed with the performances leading up to this, but it, it felt like we got a lot right on Saturday. I thought so. I, I mean, I don't think. If, if you, I mean, I don't think all of their performances this season have been terrible. I think there's been good, good parts in all of them, bar Wolves, to be honest. But it, against Chelsea, I thought the first goal, I think, was a little bit sloppy to concede. You know, two, two free headers from a set piece isn't isn't ideal. But they they did get back into the game, and the, the change Ralph made at half time, bringing Diallo, and I thought Diallo added so much more. He you know, he he was driving the ball forward at times, which we saw him do at Sheffield United, and. You know, Southampton have missed a mid. You know, they miss a midfielder that, that is able to do that. So that was a positive Prowse's penalty, of course. And then, as as the others have said, I once they scored that and it was one all, because Southampton were on top, I just couldn't see that game going any other way than a draw. To be honest, I didn't think Chelsea had. You know, they were stifled essentially. Ralph had, had matched them up and stifled them. Um, but the red card changed the complexion of of, of the afternoon and. Yeah, as Steve said, once Southampton went down to 10 men, it was kind of a, a matter of time. And yeah, as, as Glenn also mentioned, that pass out to Azpilicueta and the, the first time ball across the edge of the... It was just lovely. I mean, what a move that was. So yeah, look, no one expected Southampton to go there and get a win. They played a lot better than I thought they would. And yeah, I still think there were some positives to take, even though you know the, the scoreline doesn't necessarily reflect the their display. Mm. We were crying out last week, a week before, for Nathan Teller to start. Teller and Walcott both came in yesterday. How did they do for you, Steve? Were you surprised to see Walcott going straight back into the starting lineup? Uh, Yes, given that both, obviously we knew that both him and uh, Stuart Armstrong were only back into training this week, um, or at least that's that's the impression we got from the... Um, from all the photos and, and stuff that we've seen the, um, sort of in the build-up to the game. Um, so you kind of expected that probably Redmond and and Teller would play, but the, it would prob- it, if you were going to put, put another midfielder in there, it would probably be um, Gineppo, particularly given the, the defensive output that Gineppo gives you. So yeah, it was, it was a big surprise and he didn't do much, did he? Let's, let's be honest, Walcott. Well, he could have scored. <laughs> I mean, I, th- I think, I think you, you need... You needed someone who was about six foot four and an actual centre forward to to get to get their head on that. It was, I, I wouldn't say that was even a, even a half chance. I mean, you you you'd call it a half chance for a proper centre forward, I think, and and you wouldn't you wouldn't necessarily even expect them to convert it. Such was the the pace and the amount they were that he was having to stretch for it. So I, yeah, I, I I don't I wouldn't kind of hold that against 
uh, that particular chance against him. But that was one of the, f- um, I mean, as Glenn said, that was one of the, f- the few um, sort of attacking moments that we had in in the f- in the first half. And um, yeah, a little bit a little bit frustrating, but obviously made the change at half time, and and that that had a had a positive impact. But I mean, that's, that doesn't particularly reflect well on uh, on Walcott, I don't think. I don't think it's any secret that Ralph's not been happy with his number 10s. What did you make of Teller and Walcott yesterday, Glenn? Was that a surprise for you that those two would start? Um, it was a surprise that Nathan Teller went from being behind Shane Long on the pecking list, pecking order last week to um, suddenly starting the game. Yeah, that was a bit of a surprise. I was absolutely stunned that Walcott came straight back into the team. And I was surprised that Elianusi dropped out because he's been the best one of our wide players, which is a pretty low bar. But he he's been the best one so i was i was i was surprised teller i thought fluffed his lines a little bit to be honest he he kind of joined in with all the others in you know there's the odd good moment and there's the odd sort of bit where he looks exciting or there's a nice touch in midfield but ultimately linking up with adam armstrong or anyone else in the box just didn't happen so i think um you know they they need to do more of those players um especially in the games we've got coming up um i felt a bit sorry for adam armstrong he's you know he's he's picked again as a lone re- you know really a lone striker i know redmond was up with him in the first half but it that's that's not his game and that, that's already been proven so i was i was frustrated that we went we went with that and che adam spent the whole game sitting on his hands so there, there was some frustrations there i have to say because defensively i thought you know we were good but a- attack wise Nah, not not enough happening for me. Any surprises for you, Dan, with that starting lineup? We talked about Carl Walker Peters at left back and whether that was the right thing um, to do against Wolves. He didn't have the best game of the season, and uh, and there he is starting again yesterday. And I thought he did perhaps a little better. I th- I was I was impressed by Walker Peters yesterday. Yeah. Actually, I thought yeah, he so looked he looked good yeah. um, going forward, and I thought he was he was good at the back as well. I don't think there's too much he could have really done about that pass out to Azpilicueta you know that was just the, a, a brilliant a brilliant ball so yeah he was one of the better players on the pitch in, in my opinion for Southampton in terms of of what Glenn said going forward I think maybe Shea Adams being left out was a bit of a surprise yeah I, I I can understand and I've had a few conversations this week as to why Ralph you know turns to Redmond and you know still believes in him and keeps faith and so on so I wasn't surprised to see him in the team but I was surprised that Adams was left out I think Adam Armstrong did look isolated at times and you know you're, you're, you're playing against European champions it's not going to be an easy afternoon is it going up against three centre-backs one of them being Thiago Silva hmm. so yeah Southampton are always going to struggle but the, 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 the key thing going forward is for me I still don't think we've seen enough kind of positives going forward from them yet but the good thing is now there's a couple of weeks and let's not judge how how many goals they score against Chelsea I think you do that over the next month or so when they play teams around them. That's the homework for the international break, isn't it, uh, to work on that? A couple of incidents to talk through. A goal ruled out just before half-time, which uh, Thomas Tuchel didn't like. He got a booking for that. What did you make of that incident, Steve? Right to be ruled out or not? Because that seems to be the most controversial call of the day. It was... I mean, I, I was surprised that... I mean, surprised on, on two fronts, really. One, that they went back as far as they did. Because, I mean, I, when, when I... Was, when I saw it, I, th- I assumed they were looking at the, I think uh, Lukaku, Lukaku jumps. Yeah. Lukaku mm. jumps all over Livramento at the far post when the, when Aspilicueta puts the cross in, and I kind of thought, well, is he looking at that? In which case, okay, you might have an argument, but it it would be tough. But no, he's he's gone all the way back to this one on the other side, and I mean, I, I find it baffling that Mike Dean sent Atkinson all the way over to the. Um, to the monitor to look at it because it's not a it's not the sort of not the sort of thing that we've ever that we've I don't think we've ever seen a a, refer, a referee go and look at the monitor for a decision like that it's always been for always been for like red card challenges or or for a penalty not for not for something relatively minor um, so that that was that was a surprise but I mean the one the one thing that does annoy me with uh, managers being um, annoyed with certain decisions going their way uh, or not going their way. Sorry, it's just the pure hy- hypocrisy of it all. Like they are all completely blinded, and it's all um, oh we're we're really hard done by. But that that really tight decision that went in our favour was um, was absolutely the correct decision. I mean, if if managers had some sort of I don't know humility and and kind of even handedness about it. They could sort of say, sort of shrug your shoulders and say, yeah, okay. Some, I mean, sometimes these these things go against you. Rather than having this black and white viewpoint that oh, every decision against us is an absolute outrage, 
and every tight one that goes in our favour was clearly 100% right. Um, it's just irritated, massive bugbear of mine, and yeah, man, managers need to kind of be a little bit, little bit more, a uh, little bit more objective at times. I think. So the rule there, Glenn, then is: has the defence had chance to reset? That's what they were talking about afterwards. Um, whether that was a foul or not, you could argue that we did have the chance to reset because there was at least another cross that came in after that. So, do you think we got away with one there? Uh, yeah, a little bit. I mean, at the end of the day, it was Aspilicueta did foul him, but. The, the process, you know, it's a grey area. How how far do you go back to to work out, um, you know, to work out whether you should, you know, include that in the build up of the goal? I mean, Saints never got another touch on the ball until it ended up in the net. So you could argue it. Well, yes, it was right to go back that far because that was where the possession turned over. But um, I think I think the, the ball could have pinged around our penalty area for another five minutes and we still wouldn't have reset. We were all <laughs> over the place. So uh, I think you could also argue that we were we got a bit fortunate. At the end of the day, it was nodded into the net by Werner, who's not the biggest. And he was in amongst sort of like all of our defenders who were all just ball watching. So, it, it yeah, I think you could you could argue it either way. At the end of the day, it was a foul by Aspilicueta. But you know, and that, and I, that I agree with Steve's point. That's what that's what Tuchel was going on about. You know, because he he saw that bit on the screen, and you know, it's like, what do you mean that's a foul? But I think managers do it. You know, we had conversations last year about making a fuss about decisions because it's 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 not necessarily for that decision that you do it. It's for the next one. It's to try and put pressure on. So at least there's some something in the referee's mind going. Well, I gave that one against Chelsea, so maybe I'll give him the next one. I don't. Yeah, I don't know. It's a it's a cynical game, isn't it? Which comes to <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, let's talk about the changes at half time first of all, because Theo went off and then Romeo comes into a back three, which seemed to free up Livramento to get forward a bit. Was that purely a tactical change? Do you think, Dan? There was no injury to Theo because that's obviously the first thing that goes through your mind. No, Ralph was asked about Theo after the game and whether it was tactical or. Theo's still kind of carrying a knock or whatever, and Ralph just said no. We've, you know, we've done this a few times where we've put Oriol into the back uh, in, as a centre half, and Theo was the one to to make way for Diallo, so Oriol could could drop back and Diallo would come into midfield. Ralph didn't say there was any kind of injury or injury hangover for Theo. It was obviously his first game in a while. Um, didn't have the best forty five minutes, so no. There, there's as far as Ralph is concerned, and, and what he said to the media afterwards, no, no, no issues with Theo. Just a tactical move to put Ori as in, into defence and bring Diallo in, and it seemed to work, didn't it, Dan? I thought for a bit. Yeah, I thought it did, and that that, that goes back to the point I made earlier, where for the for the up until the penalty and, and beyond, Southampton were in control. I think it, you know, Chelsea had the rub of the green in the first half when Southampton were doing their kind of standard formation, but when Ralph matched them, uh, and uh, it did just make a a difference. And Chelsea didn't seem to. You know, Livermento was getting a bit more success down the right. He had a kind of his first half. I thought he was trying maybe too hard at times, you know, to sort of put on a show or prove a point or whatever. But the second half, I thought he he settled down and he was very good. But yeah, it it worked. The the, the change did work. What didn't work or wasn't part of the plan was losing your captain um, with twenty minutes to go. Yeah. Penalty for us, which we probably need to talk about. I don't think anybody would um, disagree with that decision, not least um, the player himself. Uh, it's, it's it's always a good sign when even the defender doesn't appeal that. So, it's a horrendous um, tackle. I, 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 was... I love the I love the replay from kind of from the opposite end. So you so you're looking at the fans behind the goal, so the guys who are closest to it. And every single Chelsea fan behind that goal was, as soon as he's put that challenge in, they've all put their hands on their heads like, oh, what have you done? <laughs> i tell you what I did think, though, Glenn, a good penalty from James Ward-Prowse, because I know he's missed one or two, but he seemed more confident from the spot. We had that last minute penalty in, in injury time against Newcastle. Then there was Mendy's mind games going on yesterday, and he, he just seemed to put it all to the back of his mind and buried it. It was it was weird for Mendy. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I knew where the penalty was going to go, and I assume every goalkeeper knows where it's going to go. I mean, perhaps he can put them in the top corner as well, but it, it's always going that side. I hope no Premier League managers are listening to this. I mean, no. I mean, it's it's so obvious he's going to go that way. And Mendy was. It was almost like he was waiting for Mendy. You know, he was bouncing around on the line, going left and right, and it was almost like he waited until his weight was on the other foot and then took it because there didn't seem to be a great deal of time, the normal length of time between. 
you know, sort of putting the ball down, walking back. It was almost like he put the ball down, walked back, waited for Mendy to go the other way and then just smashed it in the corner. And Mendy looked a bit dumb, I thought. He, he didn't really give himself much of a chance to save that. But it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a good penalty. And obviously, perhaps he's going to have to change sides at some point. It'd be interesting to see if we get any in the next uh, three games, I assume. Um, it, it was nice to, see, um, nice to see a ball bounce back out of the goal after a penalty as well. We've probably not seen that since the days of the Dell. Just as well we've got goal, goal line technology, otherwise it would be ruled out then, wouldn't it? <laughs> I'm sure there's been a few that have been ruled out of the Dell over the years. Well, that Mark, that Mark Hughes one is the one that immediately springs to mind. Yeah, one that hit the middle of the back of the net and came out. Came back <laughs> yeah. out again. <laughs> the game definitely turned on the red card then. I think we've all agreed on that. It was always going to be a red card, wasn't it? Anybody plead otherwise on that? I, I mean, I don't think it's a clear and obvious error by the ref. To, to only give a yellow um, when you see when you see the replay from behind that goal it kind of you can kind of see that Prousey studs kind of only clip kind of clip the, the back of the heel of Jorginho so while the challenge is reckless I'm not 100% certain you can be absolutely clear that he's um, endangered the opponent there but I mean you know I mean you see the way Jorginho goes down when someone breathes on him so it's oh, it's yeah. no no huge surprise that that had a that had an input and I mean obviously it's Mike Dean that's that's involved so therefore there's there's always got to be something going on isn't there I think if he'd if he'd given red straight away then I don't think um, I don't think that gets overturned the other way but I think there's that there, I think there was possibly enough doubt to to not give red, but I wasn't as as soon as as soon as it was kind of under review. I thought, yeah, we're we're in we're in trouble here. Is that just Prousey being a bit too enthusiastic? Do you think, Dan? Because um, you've obviously seen the bad pass from Mendy. If we win that ball, we're in on goal in a in a good position. So is that him just the the want to get that goal a bit too much? Perhaps. Yeah, I think so. I I, I think Ralph made that comment after the match as well, where you don't perhaps need to have that level in, of intensity. Um, you know, where Chelsea had the ball, but Prowse obviously spotted an opportunity to, to win the ball back there. And as you say, that you win the ball there and then you're in on goal. Yeah, I, I thought, I don't think there can be too many complaints. I think when in, as soon as you saw the replay, it didn't look great. Um, it's just mistimed. He's late. His studs are up. Is he in control? Probably not. Um, you know, he's sliding across a pitch, which is soaking wet by now. Yeah, it, it, it's a difficult one, isn't it? I think the minute you see the replay, and that's the problem, everything looks worse in slow motion and it did look a lot worse in slow motion. So I don't think there can be too many arguments. But as Steve said, I don't know, it's so difficult to call that Prowsey one. I just think for me, oh, Red... Oh, oh, is it worth us appealing it, do you reckon? No, I, I, don't, I don't know because I don't is. think they'd, they'd get it no. overturned. I just don't think that... I just think he's late, isn't he? He's late and his studs are up and he catches the player and he's not really anywhere near the ball. Yeah, it... it it doesn't help that Jorginho folds himself in half exactly, backwards. Exactly, yeah. Jorginho um, didn't help the situation. But no. then, you know, we've... How many times have, you know, we kind of said on this podcast that Southampton should do that a little bit more or they're in that yeah. situation. You know, they should be a bit more like that. Jorginho, you know, he played to the crowd and, and got their reward. If that was the other... If that was Jorginho going on on Prousey, Prousey would have got straight back up and Jorginho may have got a yellow card and nothing else is said. That's the difference. Yeah. It is always a bit obvious when they go to the monitor, Glenn, that you know that it's not looking good. Oh, no. I, as soon as they went to the monitor, I, I 100% knew. And <laughs> I think coming. Ralph and, yeah, and I think Ralph knew as well, um, which is why I was a little bit disappointed in the way we, we set up after the, um, after the red card because he, he had a good sort of three or four minutes to prepare for that. And, I mean, for me, the, on, the only way to go when you're down to 10 men is to go sort of 4-4-1. Four, four, but we didn't do that. We tried to keep Romeo at the back, and um, and it, you know, it, it, yeah, I mean, obviously hindsight's a wonderful thing, but you know what what we did didn't work. But no, I knew I knew he was going to go off. As as um, Steve said, it's it's Mike Dean, so it, there's always got to be, you know, something dangerous going on. Um, he loves a bit of danger, does Mike Dean? But. Um, I, I can't really complain at him, to be honest. You know, if that had been a Chelsea player on the edge of our box, I'd have been, I'd have been wanting him sent off. And I, I don't really have an issue with it, I have to admit. I suppose if you're mounting a case for the defence, Steve, is the area of the pitch something that might come into play because it's, it's not preventing a goal? Uh, no, it shouldn't do. Um, shouldn't make any difference. And in fact, you you could probably argue that it's even it's a it's an even more stupid challenge given the area is so inoffensive to us. If if it was a last ditch challenge on the edge of our own area, then it's probably more da- more dangerous in in many ways because uh, you you are naturally more desperate 
and less likely to be in control of what you're doing. Whereas on the edge of the opposition box, you're you're in kind of no danger defensively. So I th- so no, I, I don't I don't think that's a um, that's a thing really. Yeah, the, the point Dan made about you know possibly setting up a goal. Oh, it's risk risk reward, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, you see. You see Romeo and Ward-Prowse in midfield all the time. You think they're going to go in and steam into the tackle and you see them decide last minute, I'm not going to do that because it's going to be late and I'm going to get booked. And you, particularly when Romeo's on a yellow card, you, you sort of see him definitely sort of like think about his challenges a little bit more. And I just think it just it just got the better of uh, of War Prowse in that in that incident, thinking, I'm gonna set up a goal here. And I don't think he would have gone for that tackle in the centre of the pitch, to be honest. But because it was on the edge of the box, that's why he went for it. And that's um and that's um, that's what you get. And he's got a suspension to serve, so it will be strange seeing a starting lineup without his name in it since God knows when. In a weird sort of way, Dan, do you think the break might do him good? Because I know that we've spoken in the past, in the last couple of weeks, about how he could probably do with a break. I know he wouldn't be keen on that, but perhaps a game away, he might come back better. It's an interesting one. I, I, I don't know, really, because he was going to get a two-week break regardless because of the international break. He wasn't going away with England, so he was going to have a rest anyway. But... I think before before Saturday's performance, I would have said yes, absolutely. He he hasn't quite looked to the like the James Ward Prowse we're used to, but I actually thought he looked like him, his former self or the, the, the Prowse of last season against Chelsea. He just looked a bit more at it. He had a bit more vigor, as you know, he was a bit more intense, as we saw with the challenge that got himself sent off. But so after the game, I would have said no. I think he, he looked good at Stamford Bridge, but now that the, the, the break is kind of enforced on him, so. Yeah, you've got to look at the positive. It's you know, he's played an awful lot of football over the last kind of two and a bit years. So for him to sort of catch up, maybe get his breath back, if he's got any kind of lingering niggles or issues, then they can kind of hopefully disappear. But then at the same time I'm saying that and I'm thinking he's the sort of guy you want playing against Leeds, Burnley, Watford and and so on, because you want him on your pitch. He's your captain. He he kind of embodies Ralph on the pitch and he embodies the club. So for me, it's really bittersweet. Yes, it's good to, for him to have a rest, but you'd probably rather him have a rest against Chelsea and Man City than the, the teams that Southampton are hoping to beat. Yeah, big games as well. I don't think we can accuse any of the players of not putting in a shift yesterday. Jan Bednarek for me and uh, McCarthy as well. I thought had good games, Steve. I don't know about you. Because we were talking about how Lukaku would probably run our defence ragged and I didn't get that impression yesterday. No, we actually, we stood up quite well and it was a it was a pleasant surprise given, as you say, what we were kind of expecting and fearing. Lukaku's only real sort of major involvement was sort of kind of playing back playing with his back to goal and and flicking things around the corner. There, there was that nice nice little back heel in the uh in the second half where he um flicked one back for Werner which led to a great save from McCarthy. Um but other than that we kept him reasonably quiet which that was 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 testament to our to our kind of organization levels and um and yeah, Bed- Bednarek stepped up given given how ropey he was last week. That was that was useful to see, given obviously we're definitely without um, Stevens until what probably in the new year. So no, it was that was that was handy, and we'll need need more of more of yesterday's type um, performances from him rather than last week's. I did feel a bit sorry for McCarthy because I thought the the save from Chilwell's goal as was um, oh, was unreal. Was unreal. Yeah, it was incredible. And yet, just because it just obviously crossed the line, and, and we're not talking about that incredible save. So I felt I thought he had a really good he was game. excellent. I thought he was excellent. one of the saves. I can't think who it was. It might have been the Werner one where he he just got down and got it with his fingertips. It was just you know I, I could watch that on repeat. I thought it was 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 that good. Bar bar him, it could have been sort of five or six. I think. I mean, their their third goal. I'm not quite sure how they managed to miss the two oh, yeah. initial shots from what a combined total of about three yards. <laughs> <laughs> and then Chilwell pings one in from the corner of the area from basically no angle at all. It's like, how is that the one that's gone in? Yeah, yeah. I think I I think Tuchel managed the game pretty well because we kept Lukaku quiet. But the the problem, I know I took the mick out of him earlier, but the problem was actually Werner because we could. We, we dealt with Lukaku because Bednarek just got really, really tight with him. And, you know, that, that worked well. Fair play to Bednarek, as, as, um, as Steve said, he stepped up from uh, from last week. But we didn't seem to pick up Werner. And, his, and his movement's so good. As, yeah. as, bad, as bad as his finishing has been in the, what, 18 months or so he's been at Chelsea, his movement causes so many problems. 
Yeah. And we're back there in the cup on Tuesday, the 26th. That's going to be a, a completely different Lucky game. Lucky us. <laughs> well, we can learn. I think I, I don't think we've got anything to be fearful of, depending on you know who, who starts for either side. But it'll be interesting to see how that one works out. Before then, some pretty big league games to come. Let's start with Leeds and what have we made to their start of the season, Steve? Because they suddenly seem to be turning things around at the wrong time for us well they they kind of do and they don't I mean but from from what I from what I gather from a mate of mine who's a Watford fan was that Watford were absolutely pathetic and yet they still could have got a draw out of that game I'm not drawing a line through um hashtag second season syndrome for Leeds just yet I mean they've they've not looked not looked anywhere near the side that that they were last season so far but I mean they're still very dangerous they've still got basically all of the same players. The, as far as I'm aware, they've not got any major injuries or any any particular issues. It's just that for whatever reason, they've not been getting getting the results and the performances haven't been quite as energetic as, as they were last season. I mean, whether a two-week break um, helps them sort that out, who knows? Um, obviously, hopefully not, but we'll see. I think that's, that's going to be, an, be an interesting one because I don't know whether... I actually think that, that one might play into our hands a little bit because Leeds will still want to be on the front foot and that will give us opportunities in behind, whereas Wolves were largely fairly defensive and, and we struggled to break it down, whereas I think Leeds might might leave might leave a little bit more um a little bit more open at the back for us. I mentioned Leeds, Burnley, Watford Villa, Norwich. We need to look at that as a collective group, really, don't we, Glenn? Because if we're gonna pick up points anywhere, it's gonna be in those sort of fixtures. Yeah, well if we don't pick up at least well, I'd say about ten points from that lot, we're we're gonna be if we're not going to be looking too healthy um, going into December or whatever it is, at the end of that, it, it, it's a, it is a sort of pivotal moment of the season. I mean, it, we, you know, we've had some good performances in the game so far, and and it would have been a bit of a surprise, you know, a pleasant surprise if we'd won any of those games. But you know, we haven't, so we're now we're now dealing with the business of of almost having to get something from these games. You know, there are there are a few ropey old teams in the. Uh, in the Premier League, and we're we're playing a couple of them in Watford and Norwich and Burnley, really coming up. So you know, no game's easy in the Premier League, but we we do certainly have to uh, have to increase our um, our level of attacking in those five games because we still look desperately <laughs> struggling to score goals. And who comes in for James Ward Prowse, Dan, for you against Leeds? Because that's going to be a big call, isn't it? Do we think um, Stewie Armstrong might get a Game or two for Scotland and get some fitness back. A couple of training sessions under the belt, or is that Diallo's place? Um, I, for me, Diallo. I think if you're going to put Stuart Armstrong in, you probably take out Redmond or or someone else and put him further up the pitch. I think Diallo deserves the chance. He was good against Sheffield. He was good against Chelsea. So for me, Diallo. Yeah, I, I don't think it's too much of a debate for yeah Diallo. And what do we need to do differently going into that run of games, Steve? Apart from score goals, are we on the right track? I mean that's that's the that's the ultimate thing, isn't it? it? It is it is scoring goals. I mean it's it's a weird one that I actually watched the highlights back again from Wolves on Monday, I think it was, and actually we created quite a lot, of, quite a few decent presentable chances. It was just the quality of the finish was was lacking. Like the like any any powerful shots were hit straight at the keeper, and any that we kind of tried to place in the corner just didn't go anywhere near it. So actually kind of the the chances were there it was just I think everybody got into their mind that it was a really tedious performance because the a lot of the build-up was slow and quite ponderous um, but actually there were chances for, for us to have won that game um, so I, I don't think we're necessarily quite as dire as as some people have been desperate to make make us out to be but at the end of the day we're, we're starting to play against teams who have got weak, much weaker defenses than than the ones that have gone before and that's where we've got to kind of start actually being a bit more ruthless in front of goal it's a it, it's a lesson for every, every time we go and kind of screw up in in kind of the manner of that Wolves game where we've we've kind of had most of the pressure but but then got sucker punched theoretically that should be a lesson but it's a lesson that we should have learned years ago um, <laughs> we're a we're a fairly experienced team um, at this level and you know that at this level, you make one mistake, you're and and you get punished. Um, and we need to be the team doing the punishing. Um, and so far this season has not really not really been the case yet. Hopefully, two weeks on the on the training ground, working on working on that side of things, 
and yeah, who knows? Maybe that'll be the maybe that'll be the difference. I did read a stat today that Southampton have avoided um, relegation on the two previous occasions when they didn't get a win in their first seven top flight games. That was ninety six ninety seven um, when we finished one point above the relegation zone, and the other was ninety eight ninety nine um, when we finished seventeenth. So not great. I don't have any stats <laughs> on. I don't have any stats on if we failed to pick up a win in our first eight games, though. That's the only thing I think we're, we're going to be clutching at straws. Well, um, it's, uh, there, there was a stat that was doing the rounds yesterday where um, I think this is the only the second um, second time in history that the top flight um, has had as many as four teams without a win after seven games. The other was in like 1965 or something like that. But it's weird that in most of these games we've not really looked like losing for a lot for a lot of them. We've only lost three of those. It's not like it's not like Norwich where they where they've been dreadful for basically every game. Um, there have been positive signs, and I mean, it, it frustrates me when I like to see constantly on social media people saying, "Oh, we're, we're absolutely terrible." Ralph out and all this sort of stuff. It's like, well, there's it's just completely reactionary based on the result rather than actually what the what people are witnessing with their eyes. That's it's Twitter infuri- for you. Oh yeah, of course it is, but it's absolutely infuriating. You're listening to the Total Saints podcast, going to the heart of all things Saints FC. on the pod this week is Eliza Dunn from the Saints Foundation uh, to tell us more about a really special event which is going on on Saturday the 9th of October. Hi Eliza. Hi, how are you? Yeah, very well, thank you. Um, Saturday sounds fun. Uh, Tell us about this event. Yes, absolutely. So um, it's quite exciting. It's the first one for us. And basically, it's a it's a walk, a five kilometre walk throughout the city and celebrating 20 years of Saints Foundation. So it's quite hard to believe that we've been going for 20 years, but we wanted to obviously celebrate in style. And by doing that, we're offering, you know, all different types of people, young, old, from all different backgrounds to join us for this walk. Um, starting at Southampton Common at 1pm, we will then retrace the steps that many fans will know uh, via the old site of the Dell. Then moving on to St Mary's Church, where there will be the opportunity for those who are walking in memory of a loved one to light a candle, but also to learn about the history of Southampton Football Club and how and where it was formed. And then we're going to be finishing off at St Mary's Stadium for a celebration event where we've got a band playing, we've got the opportunity to have a photograph pitch side with Laurie McMenemy, and we can just have a great time and get together after what's obviously been quite a difficult 18 months. So... I was going to say you've got a few names announced that are going to be taking part and people can look out for on the day. Absolutely, yes. So we're really blessed to have Laurie McMenemy with us. Um, He is one of our charity ambassadors, but obviously a very well-established name as part of Southampton Football Club. Um, And we're really lucky to also have uh, Glenn Cockrell. He's going to be joining us as well. So there's more names to be confirmed. So it's not going to be just them two. We're hoping to have a few more people as well, but they are the ones that are fully confirmed at the moment. So yes, if you are fans of those two do come along and join us to meet them and is this a chance for fans to learn a little bit more about the history of the club Absolutely. Yeah. So the whole reason we kind of wanted to do this is, yes, it was obviously 20 years of Saints Foundation, but it's also 20 years that we've been at St. Mary's Stadium. Um, So by sort of walking via the Dell, obviously, where, you know, some legends that had obviously a lot of matches there. It was obviously the home of uh, Southampton Football Hub for a very long time. Um, But then also by stopping at the church, that's where we were founded, you know, 135 years ago. So it's um, definitely opportunity to learn more about the history of the club and what sort of level of fitness do we need i notice it does say walk and not march yes. so it's, it's not a run <laughs> it's is it? it's, it's a nice walk it is exactly so the whole point of us doing this is um so that it's inclusive for all so it's five kilometers it's not really too far although 5k is sometimes a bit further than you do think but it's a leisurely pace so we do have one of our participants 13 year old Ellie who is going to be front walking for us so she's going to be leading the march she is the face of um we march together but it is definitely walk at your own pace we're not expecting you to run it's not a race by any means we just want you all to come out for a nice leisurely walk with us celebrate with us and like you say learn about the history of the foundation and the club So how do we find out more and get ourselves signed up? Is it a ticket that we need? 
It is indeed, yes. So you can go onto the Saints Foundation website um, and once you go on there, there's the opportunity to click on our 20 years celebration and that will then link you through to our Eventbrite page where you can sign up. So it's £10 for adults, it's £5 for children under the age of 16 and under fours go free. Obviously, it is a sponsored walk, so there is a fundraising part to it as well where we're setting a fundraising target of £100 per person, but actually it's more about raise what you can and try and do your best to raise money but at no point are we going to stop you if you don't raise uh, that 100 pounds but obviously with the work that we do provide in the local community that has to be funded somehow um, so that's why we're putting on this event as well is to raise those vital funds that we need to continue delivering the amazing work that we do in the local community. Well, let's talk a bit about that work, shall we, Eliza? Because I know that a lot of our listeners will be familiar with the Saints Foundation. But for those that aren't, just tell us a bit about who you are and, and, and what you do and, and the work in the community. Absolutely. So Saints Foundation is really, really proud to obviously use the power and the passion of Southampton Football Club to make a difference within our city. So for the last 20 years, we have been transforming lives in, a, in and around Southampton, which is helping thousands of people to become more involved, healthier and empowered members of the community. So we support people from the age of four up to the age of 100. Um, and that can be supporting children and adults with disabilities. It can be supporting what we call our senior saints, older adults, become healthier members of the community, but also supporting them if they are feeling isolated. Also those that are in risk of, you know, criminality, we're helping them get their lives back on track to, you know, become good sort of committed members of the community as well. So it's, it's a real variety and we definitely like cater to all ages we cater to all abilities and um, we do also have some casual staff in schools to help children obviously get back on track develop their learning even more so there's so much more to Saints Foundation that I think many people do actually already know. If Basically, if you live in Southampton, you probably know or have heard of someone who has been supported by Saints Foundation. And we know that the last 18 months have been difficult for everybody, charities in particular. How have you guys found things? It has been really difficult, actually. Um, one thing that I'm really proud to sort of talk about as part of the last 18 months is that we sort of put together this programme called Saints as One. So obviously we had to really develop what we do within the local community as we weren't able to go out and deliver sessions face to face. So we did have to adapt. We did have to turn everything online, you know, teaching older adults to turn on a computer and download Zoom was quite difficult. But, you know, we did it and we delivered it. But something that I'm also really proud of is the amount of work that we did to support sort of the local community against the COVID pandemic. So that's with regards to um, prescription deliveries for our older adults who had to isolate and weren't allowed out. Um, it's supporting at the vaccination centres. It's delivering, I think, over 13,000 meals to people who were isolated within the local community. So it's it's so much more than just, I suppose, delivering the projects. We had to completely adapt everything that we did and and I think I'm actually I think it's just something to be super, super proud of that we changed what we do to help support the local community at a time of need. And that's something that we're really proud to do is we only we will support when there is a need. And that's something that, you know, is, is great for us and the local community. So we've got the walk on Saturday and then I guess you've got another busy calendar as we head towards the end of the year with uh, with events. Absolutely. So yes, we, we always like to keep ourselves busy. Um, so we do have the walk on Saturday, which is sort of our flagship event for the 20 years. Um, we do also have a, a third party charity dinner, which is happening. Um, David Wilson Barrett Holmes are hosting a dinner for us at St. Mary's Stadium. We are looking at doing a, a Christmas cash campaign. So trying to raise money over the Christmas period. And then moving into next year, we also have our standard charity dinner, which will be happening in March, happens every Every year and we were really lucky to we were able to put it on just before lockdown and it raised over a hundred thousand pounds for us so that's a real key event and we've also got a really exciting uh, big bike challenge happening next june where we're looking to ride the 20 clubs for our 20 years so starting in newcastle and making our way down to southampton football club so oh yeah <laughs> plenty of opportunity to get involved to support the foundation without the support of our donors and those people who get behind us we can't keep delivering the work that we do so you know they're really valuable 
Fantastic. So We March Together is the walk. Uh, Saturday, the 9th of October, one o'clock start on Southampton Common. Uh, look out for Glenn Cockrell and Laurie McMenemy and a few others and uh, all the details on your website. Sounds like it's going to be a great afternoon. And, and you'll get to spend the afternoon with like-minded fans as well, which are, is a big Absolutely. bonus. Absolutely, yes. Brilliant. Thank <laughs> you for sharing the details. Um, do let us know how it goes, and uh, hopefully we'll speak again soon. Oh, thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Hi, I'm Ricky Lambert. And you are listening to Total Saints Podcast. Dan, I read the piece this week about the other clubs that haven't picked up a win yet. There are clubs worse than us, aren't there? Yeah, Norwich. There's definitely <laughs> definitely one. <laughs> two, two, two others, please. Two others. Burnley and Newcastle. <laughs> yeah. Dreadful. Uh, I mean, yeah. Wat- Watford are above us with two wins, and yet they're they're. I mean, they've just sacked their manager, and they're they're about to appoint Claudio Ranieri. So I, I don't see that they're going to improve. A great deal. Win He's... championship next year. Well, yeah. <laughs> and the other thing, Dan, is that you were saying actually for for the points that we've accumulated for the games we played, um, there isn't anything to worry about. And actually, we're ahead, aren't we? We're, we're slightly ahead of last season, and and we'll, we'll be okay. Yeah, it's you can look at it kind of glass half empty, glass half full. You can be really like pessimistic. Oh, they've not won a game. It, it, it's dire. It's you know Ralph out and. Let, let's sack everyone and sign 11 new players and, you know, can we get Danny Ings back? Or you can look at it and think, well, look at the teams they've played. They picked up definitely two more points than people would have thought in the fixtures against City and United. Everton, uh, you know, they never win there. Newcastle wasn't a great performance, but again, a place they, they struggle. It was just Wolves. Wolves was the one where they were just bad. They were just awful against Wolves. I don't think they've, you know, any other match, and they still create, like they still had 18 shots. So yeah, let's not kind of dwell on it. I think at Chelsea, you still saw 11 players doing everything the manager was kind of asking them to do. They were still running for them. They were still battling. So I don't think there's too much of an issue there. Let's just see. I mean, if they lose their next two or three games, then I think, okay, you're going to an international break in November and then you've, you've definitely got something to think about. But there's been enough positives in the period where they've not won a game to kind of have hope that, when they do play teams like Norwich, Watford, Burnley, Leeds are going to be difficult. That they're going to pick up points. And um, you could, we could be sat here in six weeks' time saying, "Oh, what was everyone talking about?" You know, look at us now. We're tenth, and we've won four games on the bounce, or something like that. Because that's what happened last season. They had that awful start where they didn't pick up many points, and then all of a sudden, they picked up something like was it twenty four? I don't know, something ridiculous out of thirty points, which culminated in Ralph hitting the deck and crying. Um, <laughs> so. I'd, I mean, I'd like to ask all the doom mongers how many points they thought we'd have at this stage. Well, that's it. I mean, I, yeah. I generally said to my editor before the start, when I saw the fixtures, so I, was like, I can honestly see them going into that international break without a point. Because I thought that when you looked at the teams, and this was before a ball had been kicked, I just thought they're not teams Southampton normally get no. results against. Or, you know, it was just a, a nightmare start, wasn't it? You didn't, that it couldn't have been much more difficult unless you threw Liverpool, Liverpool into the mix as well. But yeah, they've got four points. I think look, they've got four points. They've not won a game. Their goal difference, I saw, is minus five. Again, the teams they've played, that that's not too bad, I think. It could have been an awful lot worse. I'm happy with that. <laughs> um, let's talk about score predictions then. Dan, you were the closest for the uh, the Chelsea game. I think you said 3-0, so you were definitely the closest, which means I'll give you the honour of starting for Leeds at home at St Mary's. Score prediction, please, Dan. Um, let's go 2-0 Southampton. Okay, Steve, how do you see that game playing out? I mean, it, it could be a complete damp squib or it could be absolutely mental. Um, <laughs> I mean, it could, it, Bielsa ball is just so completely erratic that anything can happen and throw that in with, with us being a little bit, a little bit weird as and when we choose to as well. I, th- I think, I think we'll sneak it. Um, so I'm going to go for 2-1. Okay. Uh, Glenn, no Prousey for that game, but... Who else starts? Who knows? What do you reckon? It's going to be a difficult one. If we we have to have some attacking threat, if if we have, you know, I think, you know, we've we've talked about Ralph selecting the like number tens. He's picked Gineppo for some games because of his defensive ability. We've got to pick players in those positions for these five games that are going to have an effect going forward. So I really really hope Stuart Armstrong comes back from Scotland duty in in a, in a fit shape to play. You know 
the Leeds game. I'd like to see Nathan Teller getting given another go as well. We've got to focus more on a, more on attacking. Obviously, you've got to keep solid, but we've got to focus more on attacking. Um, and if we do that, I would uh, I would like to think that we'll uh, we'll beat Leeds one 0 okay, There you go. There's three scores that won't happen, um, <laughs> <laughs> but we will reconvene and we shall see. Um, it's certainly one we're going to look forward to. Uh, patrons shouts for this week. Hi to Colt and Dave and. Ed and also Phil, who are in our Matt Letizia tier. Hello to Nick Reed in our Francis Benali tier as well. Pretty much it for episode 170. My thanks as always to Steve, to Glenn, and Dan. Thank you, lads. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, to find out more about becoming a TSP patron, you can check out the website where you can join our Bobby Stokes tier for just five pounds a month. And don't forget, all the recent episodes of the podcast are on YouTube, uh, so you can find the channel on there. And don't forget to hit subscribe. Don't forget to follow this podcast as well wherever you're listening. If that on Apple, you can leave us a review and a rating. The five-star ones are better, but it's up to you. And on the socials, we are at Total Saints Pod. You'll find us on Twitter and Facebook. And you can always drop us an email, maybe with a question for the panel during the week. Uh, Maybe over the international break, you can do that via the website. Thank you for listening. Have a great week and we'll catch up soon.